It's a little long. Uh, I'm not going to cut it short. I'm not going to divide it in two videos. It, this story is better told all in one shot. And it's about something that was done all in one shot. Uh, I want to tell you that in the comments there's going to be a number of links to sites that are directly related to what I'm talking about and that are of great interest in information. So you should go down in the comment section and take a look at some of the videos and websites that I list there. Okay? Uh, if you find this video uh, interesting and want to know more. Uh, also on that note, I just want to remind folks that I've got a store where I sell stuff that helps me in the production of these videos. Uh, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the link below the video or up in the upper right hand corner of my home page. And if you really want to help uh, become a member, but also uh, you can go to my store and buy my book on the uh, on collecting uh, the collector's guide for Kelsey Backpacks 19. 52 to 1972. Okay, the commercial's over. Let's get into the video. Let me introduce you to an old friend. This is the World War II mountain rucksack. Some people call it the M41 sack, rucksack. Uh, that's improper terminology, but we're not going to geek out on the military aspects of this pack. Why am I calling it an old friend? Well, it's because this pack, not, not this particular pack, but a pack just like it, was my first big boy pack. My dad owned the pack and I used it on my very first long distance solo hike uh, in 1971. I hiked the length of the Kankamagus Highway in New Hampshire, 20 some odd miles. Uh, I hiked the highway because at the time I wasn't really uh, confident enough to do a, a wilderness type hike. So I decided to stick to the highway and the developed campgrounds. But that's not what this story is about. What this story is about is how my dad got his pack that I was able to use. Let's talk about that. On August 5th, 1948, an article appeared in all four newspapers in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, this one. Reporting something that nobody had ever done before. Somebody had hiked the entire length of the Appalachian Trail and let the world know about it. After reading that article, my dad went out to a surplus store and he bought a World War II mountain rucksack. And that's because that's the pack that was used by Earl Schaefer in the first reported through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Let's tell you a little bit about the pack and a little bit about a little bit more about Earl. During the First World War, the United States Army sent a regiment of troops to Italy. In the First World War, Italy was our ally and we sent troops to help them fight the Austro-Hungarians uh, in Italy. And it turned out the fighting was going to be in the Alps. 
Now, the problem with that was that the way the military thinking of the time was is that every man was an infantryman, unless you were in the cavalry. That was it. You were either infantry or you were cavalry. Both of those services uh, had similar gear, sometimes the same gear, and the cavalry had some specialized gear. Okay, but other than that, if you were an infantry, if you were not cavalry, the gear that you wore in Italy, in the Alps, was exactly the same gear that was worn by a doughboy in the trenches of France or somebody on garrison duty in the Philippines. There was no real change to the gear and even the uniform for climate or for duty. Everybody was an infantry man. Everybody was the same. Now, needless to say, the, the 332nd Infantry Regiment that served in, in Italy, they served bravely and with distinction. But they suffered a great deal because uh, they did not have mountain equipment. Now, as war, uh, another world war, approached, the United States Army realized that they were prob we were probably going to be drawn into the conflict in Europe. And that was the thinking and that was the planning of the military starting in about 1940. And at about that time, they converted one regiment and grew it to a full division of troops to fight in mountainous terrain, in the mountains, anticipating the possibility of combat in the Alps. They recruited all over the country from the National Ski Patrol and other skiing organizations as well as other outdoorsmen, mountaineers who were not skiers, they actively recruited those individuals and put them together in one division, about 20,000 people. And then they began to develop equipment. They, they can see, we have, you've already seen, I hope, the video on uh, Omi is a name you should know, okay? I will link to that video at the end of this video. Uh, but they recruited guys like that to help them develop equipment and tactics and training. One of the things that they developed for the 10th Mountain Division was the mountain rucksack. Now, let me just say this. To say they developed it is kind of prettying things up just a little bit because this isn't much more than a Bergen pack. I mean, the Army adopted a civilian design that had been around since 1908, okay, the Bergen Pack. And at the end of this video, there will be another video link to the Bergen Pack and how the Bergen Pack was developed. So when you get to the end of the video and you see the old man walking in the woods with his dog, there'll be two videos up here, okay, you can click on one or the other. But the, the Birkin Pack is nothing more than just a big bag on a frame. And it's got three pockets on the outside. You can fit a whole lot of stuff in a Birkin Pack. And the Army chose the pack because it was developed for skiing. Okay? Uh, Ole Bergen developed this pack for uh, cross-country skiers. Okay, it's designed to be held close to your body with the weight down low because skiers spend a lot of time bent over and shussing. And that's a real word. Schuss is a real word. It's a German word. So that is why the 10th Mountain Division had these packs. Okay, we'll talk about some other 10th Mountain gear maybe uh, later on. We are going to talk about 
Tenth Mountain a little bit more as the history of gear progresses through World War II. Uh, one ironic twist of fate. In the previous video on the history of gear World War II, we talked about the 1943 field pack and how it was used by the 10th Mountain Division in Italy. Well, the reason why they were using that pack in Italy is because when they were sent overseas, somebody screwed up and they didn't send a bunch of this gear. The way that shook out for post-war backpackers, campers, and backcountry campers uh, is that there were a lot of these surplus because they were sitting in warehouses on the dock side. And also because the, uh, the Army developed these for other troops other than the 10th Mountain Division who would be serving in uh, Arctic or cold weather environments like troops garrisoning uh, Alaska. It was found out that it was not a great pack for normal infantry combat. Fantastic if you're going to be skiing, but if you're going to be mud slugging, it's not the best pack. Got a high profile. You lay down, you, you throw your body on the ground, that thing sticks up, tells the guy right where to drop his mortar or grenade. We're getting off this subject. That's a little bit about the, the uh, mountain rucksack. Now let's talk about Earl. Now, Earl was born November 8, 1918, uh, just three days before the end of the First World War in York, Pennsylvania. He grew up in the uh, country, and he had a, a best friend uh, that the two boys were inseparable. Uh, the other boy's name was Walter Weinmiller. Uh, they regularly hiked a section of the uh, Appalachian Trail, uh, which in 1936 had been completed. It had started working on it in 1921. In 1936 they had completed the entire route. Not everything was hammered out, but it was, they had the route and a lot of it was cleared. Uh, he hiked a section in Pennsylvania uh, and they went regularly. Uh, now the two boys, they had names for each other and, and like most of the young boys of the time, uh, the names that they gave each other were centered around Native American uh, tradition and ethos. Uh, Walter called uh, Earl Lone Brave. Okay, I don't know what Earl called Walter. Maybe it was just Walter, I don't know. Now, like the United States Army in the formation of the 10th Mountain Division, these two boys uh, who were uh, reaching the age of graduation from high school, uh, realized that uh, their nation would probably soon become involved in a war and they decided not to wait for a declaration of war. They decided to get in a little early. Walter joined the Marine Corps, uh, Earl joined the Army uh, and got duty in the Signal Corps, radios and such. Uh, in 1941, December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, thus guaranteeing the United States becoming involved in the Second World War. Being in the Marines, Walter was sent to the Pacific, and coincidentally, so was Earl. He was sent to the Pacific uh, by the United States Army. When Earl got home, he found out that his uh, best friend, Walter, had uh, been killed at Iwo Jima. Now on the hikes that they took in, in Pennsylvania on the Appalachian Trail, at one point they made a pact with each other. You know, they, they both knew they were going in the service. They made a pact with each other that they would together hike the length of the Appalachian Trail. They, they, they so much loved the portions that they were hiking that they decided they were going to do the whole thing. Uh, Earl was kind of devastated that, uh, at the death of his friend uh, and didn't immediately act on that pact. But in 1948, he was having uh, what we would call today PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And he decided that he would, in his own words, walk off the war. 
by honoring the pledge he had made to Walter and hiked the entire length of the Appalachian Trail. He did it for two reasons. One, to walk off the war. Two, to, oh, the computer made a thing. To walk off the war, uh, which is something that, that modern day uh, therapists do recommend for veterans is long distance hiking to help with PTSD. Uh, but he also did it to, to honor his friend Walter Weinmiller. So, let's talk a little bit about that achievement and a little bit about the gear that he used on the Appalachian Trail in his 2,000 mile achievement. Earl's gear list uh, looks a little bit different from what uh, the modern day through hiker might use. Uh, in addition to the mountain rucksack, he carried a World War II surplus Army Air Corps survival tent, a surplus Marine Corps poncho, a surplus Navy turtleneck sweater, a rain hat, a wool Army blanket, a compass, a knife, a hand axe, a sewing kit, a snake bite kit, one week's worth of food, one pair of trousers, a couple of t-shirts, a few pair of socks, one pair of Russell moccasins. Now after a week, uh, Earl engaged in another first. So not only was he the first uh, hiker to attempt a through hike, but he was also the first through hiker to ditch heavy gear after a week when he mailed that seven pound tent home and he used his poncho as shelter for the remainder of the hike. He was also the first through hiker to uh, do something that is tradition almost on the Appalachian Trail on long distance trails and then he, he was the first hiker to cut the handle off of his toothbrush in order to save weight. He had that one pair of boots. Today modern through hikers will go through two or three pairs of Merrells or, or whatever the modern uh, whatever their choice of modern day footwear is. Earl wore that in that one pair of boots throughout the entire 2,000 miles. He had it resold, had them resold a couple times, but he wore the same pair of boots for the entire four months he was on the trail. Uh, the picture's been up. Uh, I will tell you that those are in the Smithsonian Museum along with his uh, notebook. Uh, the curators at the Smithsonian Museum say they don't open that drawer a whole lot because it kind of smells. I mean, you get a pair of boots that were worn for 2,000 miles. They may have been a room. Uh... But that's, when you look at that gear, uh, you wonder how he made it. Now, in 1948, when he set out on his hike, only seven other people had completed the entire Appalachian Trail. None of them had done it in one push. In other words, they were what we call today section hikers. Some of them took several years by hiking different sections of the trail each year or at different times in order to be able to say that they had hiked the entire length. Earl was the first one to report that he completed the trail in one continuous hike. Okay, now, some of you may notice that I've been a little careful with my words when it comes to uh, Earl's first through hike. I say that he is the first person to report that he had made a through hike in 1948. That's been, there has been some controversy uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, and Earl's first hike started in controversy. It's been steeped in controversy ever since. Uh, 
when he first reported the Appalachian Trail Conservancy that he had uh, completed the hike. He joined the Conservancy just before he began it. Uh, it was met, he was met with a great deal of skepticism. They did not believe it. Uh, the first thing was is that the Appalachian Trail had never been actually designed as a long-distance trail that you would hike for the purpose of going from the start to the end. The other thing is, nobody thought it could be done. Uh, nobody thought anybody would want to. Uh, Earl was smart enough to send the Appalachian Trail Conservancy postcards along the way. And he kept copious notes in his little black book, which is in the Smithsonian along with his boots. And he took a lot of pictures, and there were people who remembered meeting him. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy was not really enthusiastic about recognizing the achievement. There were a lot of people who thought that encouraging such a thing was dangerous. But then they realized that people were avidly reading his book, which they refused to publish, and he self-published. Uh, and it was bringing a good deal of attention, positive attention, to the Appalachian Trail. So they eventually did recognize it, and for many years it was a definitive statement to say that Earl Schaefer made the first through hike although there are always those who say, well, you know, somebody could have made it and just didn't tell anybody. I don't know why you'd do it and not tell anybody, but yeah, that's a possibility. But in 1994, a gentleman uh, got a uh, solicitation letter from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy to uh, become a member. And when he did that, he had a sudden memory of hiking with his uh, Boy Scout troop that came from the Bronx, uh, hiking the entire length of the Appalachian Trail in 1936. Now, there's a bunch of problems with this story. There's a lot of people who want to believe it. Uh, there are several inconsistencies, and people point out inconsistencies in Earl's notes and his trip, so we'll say that. But this gentleman was the last surviving member of the trip. Uh, he claimed there were seven guys on the trip. He could only remember the name of three of them. And they claimed that he that they hiked southbound from Maine and were able to complete the trip from Maine to New Hampshire in two weeks in snow. Okay, in June. So there's a problem right there. Uh, hiking from Katahdin to the New Hampshire border in two weeks is an achievement in and of itself. Uh, snow in June, eh, it's possible. Uh, but, once that report came out, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy uh, put a, an article in, in Appalachian Trail News, uh, and they uh, recognized the four gentlemen, the, 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 the one fella and the three peoples whose names he did remember, recognized them as 2,000 milers. They do not officially recognize the 1936 through hike. Okay, since about oh the late 70s, uh, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy doesn't keep track of uh, a rigorous track of through hikers. When Earl in the in the immediate years after Earl made his hike, they were very very stringent about giving someone the credit for making a through hike, okay? There were interviews, uh, there were uh, uh, letters and, and, and other things be, be, that had to be submitted before the ATC would recognize your through hike. After about 1975, there were so damn many people doing it that they just decided, okay, fine. Today, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy will list you as a 2,000 miler if you send them a letter and say you did it. 
I could, theoretically, send them a letter today and say that I made an Appalachian Trail through hike in 1979. And they would put my name on the list. Okay, wouldn't ask me for any proof. It would be untrue. I have never through hiked the Appalachian Trail. But, because of all that, and in an effort to be truthful, I do say that he is the first person to report making a through hike, although I do believe he is actually the first person to through hike the Appalachian Trail. Now what I love about this story, first off, while Earl Schaefer did not uh, set off the bomb, the explosion, of the backpacking revolution of the 1960s and 1970s. He's the guy that lit the fuse. He's the guy that put the idea in people's heads that they could do long distance hiking. They, they could go from beginning to end on the Appalachian Trail. All it took was a little bit of guts, a few pairs of shoes, and four to six months off of work. That's one of the reasons why I have never through hiked the Appalachian Trail. As far as World War II's contribution to the history of gear, as far as the World War II mountain rucksack, what it shows us that, that the uh, one basic contribution uh, that the Second World War made to uh, backpacking and backcountry camping and camping in general is, is that the military had ceased doing just infantry gear. They started looking at specialized gear, gear for mountain troops, uh, gear for hospitals, large hospital tents and, 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 and other things like that, uh, which directly led to uh, the development of other gear in the post-war period. I said before when I did the 60, uh, that the 43 pack, that uh, the 43 pack represents the last time the military made an innovation in load carrying equipment. Uh, the Second World War, when you get right down to it, and we'll talk a little bit more, but the Second World War did not really do much for the innovation of camping gear, uh, other than the 43 field pack. Well, what the Second World War did was just a whole bunch of production. And it created gear for use by mountaineers. And if you paid attention throughout the history of gear series, you may notice, and this trend is going to increase from the next 20 30 years after the end of the World War II, but you may notice that it is gear that is developed for mountaineers that percolates down through backpackers, long distance backpackers, backcountry campers, and car campers. What the 10th Mountain Division did, what the Army's formation of the 10th Mountain Division, the thing that was uh, Although it was born out of the horror of war, it put 20,000 guys with common interest in outdoors and outdoor gear together. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in any one of the barracks in the 10th Mountain Division between 1941 and 1945, just to listen to the stories those guys told about when they were camping and the kinds of things that they were going to do with camping gear after the war. We'll talk a little bit more about the 10th Mountain as the history of uh, camping gear in World War II progresses. But let me just lay that out there. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. That helps other people with the same interest that you and I have to find this channel, to find this content. Stick around to the end of the video. The old man's going to walk down through the woods now, and there are going to be two videos show up in the corners. One will be about Omi Diver, and the other will be about the Bergen Pack. Both of those have a direct bearing on what we've been talking about in this video. In the meantime, 
We'll see you down the trail.